going to be reading from uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 6 through 15. I do want to take a moment to thank the congregation, all the brothers and sisters here for their prayers on behalf of my grandson. It certainly shows the power of prayer to see a young child right on the verge of death and all the prayers offered up and to see him uh, just this past week, one week out of the hospital, and he's running around like a normal three-year-old now. So I uh, have no doubt about it that it's the power of prayer and work in our lives every day. Again, I'll be reading from 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, beginning with verse 6, and uh, we'll be reading from the New King James Version. But we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us. For we were not disorderly among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toil night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you, not because we do not have the authority, but to make ourselves as, as an example of how you should follow us. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. Now those who are such, we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. And if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person and do not keep company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Thank you, Brother Paul. We also are so thankful for the dues of Wesley and so thankful for the very avenue of prayer which we are able to engage in by the graciousness of God and it's certainly not something that we deserve and it's good to be reminded of that from time to time and also uh, to be encouraged uh, in these opportunities where we are able to approach our Father in Heaven together and are able to find comfort and uh, peace in these types of difficult situations. So glad that Wesley is doing well. Uh, let's also keep in mind the McFerrin family as Kathy uh, passed from this life Saturday morning, very early in the morning. Obviously, we love our sister Carol, uh, Carolyn and uh, Olivia, and so thankful that they're here with us and uh, mindful of their loss, and we need to be praying for them. And uh, if there's anything that we can do, obviously, we need to be seeking that out and, and doing it as we're able to. I also want to uh, announce and make sure that everyone's aware of the um, upcoming baseball game that will be the... Uh, uh, Gwinnett Stripers that will be taking place in June. Um, that is listed and noted there on the bulletin. $11 is the cost of tickets. Uh, anyone who is interested in attending, please uh, jot your name down and the number that will be going in your party on the list outside of the foyer. And we will be uh, purchasing tickets as a congregation and then we'll let you know um, uh, exactly how to uh, to make ready for that event. So keep that in mind as well. Also, there are details regarding the work in India and uh, the mission that is taking place regarding Gary Jones and his work and the items needed for the children there in that region. Uh, that is also noted in the bulletin. There are several items listed. And so please keep that in mind. And also, don't forget about the blessing bags. Uh, I hope that you're taking those blessing bags and taking them out into the community. Uh, I know that it is an encouraging opportunity to engage in trying to serve others and looking for ways in which we can assist in their needs physically, and hopefully it might open doors and opportunities for us to assist them when it comes to spiritual things. Uh, Paul just read a few moments ago in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, 6 through 15, a topic that oftentimes is uncomfortable for brethren. It is a topic that is not something that folks get excited about. It is a topic in an area in the scriptures that a lot of times uh, makes people uncomfortable. It can be awkward. It can be difficult to engage in. Uh, sometimes the phrase is used, church discipline. And really that's what we see when we think of that phrase, if you've ever heard it before, being described for us here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, 6 through 15. Uh, what really is discipline when it comes to institutions? Do uh, institutions in other areas in life engage or apply 
discipline and are there moments when discipline is necessary well think with me for just a moment maybe a work type environment usually work type environments especially if it's a large organization or a government type entity uh, no one can be fired just at random but there are certain they can get back on track being a good performer once again think about even uh, in football or in sporting type events you know uh, the NFL season hasn't started yet it's still several months away but these teams these professional teams are getting ready and preparing for the next season and in doing so they have to call all their players to come back into camp and to begin training and preparing for that next season and oftentimes uh, if you pay any attention to the sports media some big shots or some big names think that they are good they don't necessarily need to show up on time or even show up for several weeks uh, in order to prepare with the team because of maybe their name or because of their popularity and so uh, these teams then enact different kind of disciplinary tools or or features or actions in order to provoke these players to get in line and to come back and assemble themselves with the team so that the team can prepare uh, for the season ahead what about even the family institution uh, do families enact discipline? Do they engage in discipline? Absolutely. Think about even young children. We spent some time talking about that last Sunday together as we were thinking about mothers and the responsibilities of motherhood and training their children and disciplining their children. Certainly children need to be disciplined and the family unit is an institution where discipline is able to be applied so that behavioral changes can occur. We spent some time looking, for example, in Hebrews chapter 12, Verses 3 through 11, we've looked at this passage several times together, but we see how the love of God is actually manifest when we are corrected, when we are disciplined. And so uh, thinking about all these other institutions, what about God's people? What about God's family? Paul explains to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 3, and verse 15, that the church is the house of God. And so the house of God, the institution that belongs to God, the church, are there certain disciplinary measures that God has commanded and required? And we're going to ask several questions as we think about this topic, noting and stating, as we already have, this is a difficult topic. It's not a topic that folks usually enjoy studying. It's not a topic that people really uh, get excited about engaging in. Uh, similar to potentially a family unit doesn't get excited over the fact that uh, they have to ground their children or they have to remove privileges or they have to spank their children. It's not something that parents just sit in a corner in and say, hey, I'm really excited to go discipline my children. It's something that's uncomfortable, that's uh, challenging to engage in, and it requires commitment and an understanding and wisdom to do so appropriately. And so we're going to ask ourselves several questions regarding discipline in the church. Number one, is discipline spiritual? Is discipline spiritual? In other words, is it even spiritual to engage in discipline. You know, the world would have us to believe that uh, disciplinary type things doesn't have anything to do with Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is loving. God is loving. And so God would never correct us. God would never tell us that we're doing anything wrong because that isn't who God is. That's what the world would have us believe. So to be spiritual then is not to engage in something that is uh, of a correction type nature, but it's to engage in always approval, always tolerance, all the time. Well, look with me back in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. And notice with me here in verse 14. And if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle or in this letter, note that person and do not keep company with him that he may be ashamed. Paul here notes the fact that, hey, I'm writing unto you a letter. I'm writing unto you an epistle. And that epistle that I'm writing unto you is to be the guideline, it's to be your pattern, uh, what it is you're to be following if you want to be right with the Lord. And if you're not going to be keeping after these words, then this person needs to be ashamed so that they can then make correction and make behavioral changes in their life. Look with me uh, as Paul explains to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Look with me there in verse 37. Uh, Paul will explain to these brethren here that if anyone thinks themselves to be spiritual, they need to acknowledge that the things which Paul is writing unto them are the commandments of the Lord. He will explain likewise to Timothy in the second epistle, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. God is the one who has provided these words that Paul is writing. God is the one who has made it possible that these letters that have been then provided for us in the New Testament came about, and they are the commandments of God. And therefore, if we want to be spiritual, we need to then align ourselves with what it is God has provided to us. 
us. And that's what Paul's explaining there to the brethren in Thess Thessalonica, chapter 3 and verse 14. Hey, uh, our words need to be obeyed. These words that we're writing to you, these letters that we're sending you, they're not just uh, you know, notes that should just be maybe glossed over and then tossed into the trash. These are the commandments of God. They are inspired of God. They are to be followed. They are to be adhered to. And so is discipline spiritual? Absolutely it's spiritual. God has given us a certain uh, set of guidelines, a certain set of orders or commands, and they are to be followed. And if they are not followed, then we ourselves are not living spiritually as we ought to be living. And so therefore, correction is needed so that we can make Changes. And number two, is discipline subjective? Is discipline subjective? In other words, is it at the whim of anyone? Is it at the whim of a preacher? Is it at the whim of maybe an elder or an eldership? Is it at the whim of just any brother? I think one of the reasons why we struggle with church discipline is because in times past, the Lord's church has overbound in certain areas on certain things. Uh, brethren, throughout congregations of the Lord people, uh, Lord's people have started to think, well, if you're not here at 9 o'clock, uh, then you are not right with the Lord. Because we always started Bible class at 9 o'clock, and to change it from 9 o'clock to 10 a.m., well, that's unscriptural. And so those kinds of rules then are set on a uh, congregation of people and bound at certain times. And so people start to think, well, who are you then to tell me that I need to change my ways or my behavior? Who are you to discipline me? Who are you to challenge me in my spirituality when the rules that you are making are not aligned with God's Word? That would be objective. That would be a case where discipline should not be applied. But the discipline that Paul is talking about here, the discipline that God has provided for us, it's not objective. Or rather, it's not subjective. It is uh, according to the standard that God has provided to us. It is according to a, a consistent rule as provided in the Scriptures. Look with me there, verses 6 and 7 in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. But we command you, brethren... In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly, and not according to the tradition which he received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we were not disorderly among you. Disorderly. What is the idea here? Disorderly means that there is a certain uniform, there is a certain unmovable standard that is set, a tradition as he describes here, that is defined by the Gospel, by the New Testament, as it was inspired and brought about, as we saw previously in the prior point. And disorderly is to not walk according to it. In other words, this one here is out of step. Disorderly is when a football player doesn't show up to his football team's practice in order to prepare for the season. Why? Because the rest of the team is doing that. They're contractually obligated. To be disorderly is to not show up and assemble with God's people. To be disorderly is to behave and live in a lifestyle in a way that is out of step and not aligned with God's commandments. That's disorderly. And so is discipline as required by God, is it subjective? Is it just to the whim of anyone and whatever they may think might be a reason as to whether or not someone is right with God? Well, they wore a red tie instead of a blue tie. No. No. It's objective. It's objective. It is unbiased. It is only biased to the Scriptures, to God's law. Look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Here we see a set of commands given by the Apostle Paul because of the misbehavior of one here in this congregation in Corinth. And in verse 11, Paul explains there that he's written unto them not to keep company with anyone named a brother, notice, who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. So we see the extent of the discipline, but we also see here a category, a group of categories of those who would be behaving in a way that is disorderly, that is not according to the tradition, to the law as provided by God. Notice as well in Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16. Notice here in verse 17. Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine. Paul doesn't say contrary to my opinion, contrary to the whims of another. No, but contrary to the doctrine, those who are causing divisions and offenses, contrary to what it is that we have taught you, what we have provided you by the inspiration of God, you need to avoid those kinds of folks. 
They're not walking in the way that they should be walking, in the way in which they've been brought up and trained to walk. And so is discipline spiritual? Yes. Is it subjective? No. Is discipline surprising when it's done according to the Scriptures? No. I think this is another reason why we avoid it. Well, we don't want to just go up to a brother and tell him, hey, I'm withdrawing fellowship from you because of the way in which you're behaving and just catch them off guard. To do so would be cruel. Well, that actual description is correct. To do so would be cruel because it would be surprising. That brother or sister is all of a sudden indeed caught off guard and all of a sudden wondering, what is it that's going on? Why is it that you're doing this to me? What is it that I've done? And so discipline in the church is not surprising. Notice with me there in verse 12 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Verse 12, Paul says, Now those who are such we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. Hey, there's a certain level of warning that needs to be provided to these brethren. They need to be aware of what it is that they are to be doing correctly before it is that you carry out verse 14. Verse 14 then is where the prescription of discipline is then described by Paul. But before that ever even gets carried out, first, hey, they need to be aware of it. This is what they ought to be doing. This is how they ought to behave. Notice with me in Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. Jesus here gives us kind of a, a stair step, if you will, regarding discipline and the way in which it can be carried out. The way in which uh, we then take away the fact it is not surprising. Notice beginning here in verse 15 of Matthew chapter 18. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. Folks, I think oftentimes when we talk about discipline in the church, we just immediately revert to the end there of verse 17. Well, you know, it would be cruel. It would be, it would be mean to just tell a brother uh, they're lost and we don't want anything to do with them. And so we're not going to engage in church discipline. <laughs> Uh, well, folks, that's not what God has provided for us here. There's a certain stair-stepping of extremes regarding the way in which discipline is to be carried out. Immediately, there's maybe a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Maybe that conversation happens between two brethren because of an issue they're having. Maybe that conversation happens between the, the preacher and a brother or sister, or maybe uh, the elders or an elder and a brother or sister, and, and it's an attempt to kind of ease that person in, ease that brother or sister in to the reality that they are lost and out of step with God's law. Hey, we need to make you aware of something. Hey, there's something that I just want to bring to your attention. Are you aware of this? Well, if the person is indignant, if they're just refusing to uh, humble themselves and acknowledge their behavior and that it needs to change, then what is to be done next? Well, hey, maybe bring a few more folks along. By the way, those folks aren't to be brought along having been given a pre-read to the situation. They're to be brought along as a, a party that is unaware of what's going on so that they can then unbiasedly, uncoached, evaluate the situation and say, hey, you know what? I didn't, I wasn't aware that this was going on, but this accusation here or this behavior here, it's unacceptable. It needs to change. Well, that's not going to be very credible if that person has already been pre-coached. And so uh, if we're going to do this correctly, we need to make sure that we're acknowledging this third party and their lack of knowledge that should exist before this situation and this kind of meeting even occurs. But if that doesn't help, if this brother or sister still does not make a change, repent, then what's to be done? Well, then the church is to be made aware. Hey, this brother or sister, you know, they continue to show up from time to time. Uh, they continue to, to try to engage and claim themselves to be a member here of this congregation, a faithful standing member. Uh, we need to make sure that they are aware that that is not the case. 
They are living in a lifestyle. They are uh, cleaving to a certain sin. They are unwilling to change their behavior in a certain way. And, and we need to make sure that they know this in hopes that they might change going forward. And so as a congregation, then, this is how we're going to deal with this brother. This is how we're going to deal with this sister. We're going to treat them as a heathen or a tax collector here. The idea is this person is someone that we're trying to avoid. They keep our distance from. Now folks, again, discipline is not an option. It's not something that just like, oh, well, we choose to do it or we don't choose to do it. That's like saying, well, uh, do you choose to discipline your children? Well, I'm going to just choose not to discipline my children. Well, then you're not going to be the parents you should be being. You don't get that option. Folks, if we're a member of the church, discipline is a reality. It's a tool that God has given us in order to elevate and esteem the church in the position that it's supposed to be in the sight of God. With us. As Paul explains in Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 4. It's the highest institution in the history of all the universe. The church. Folks, this isn't just a social club. It's not just a get-together. This is the army of the Lord serving Him, marching our way toward heaven. And if folks are interested in that, that's a good thing. If folks don't want to be disciplined, folks, that's a good thing. Because what does that mean? That means they want to be a member of the Lord's church in a good, faithful standing. That means that we then have an opportunity to provoke them to make a change so that they can be in that good standing and right in the sight of the Lord. And when we do this, it's not a surprising occurrence. Now, surprising does not mean sudden. I think sometimes we confuse that. We think, well, we don't want to surprise them, so we're going to just wait for six months. Uh, look with me in Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. Here you have the interaction between Peter and Simon. Simon had just become a Christian. Verse 19, he says, Give me this power also that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. What was he doing beforehand? He was a sorcerer. He wants to continue in that lifestyle. Hey, Peter, I'd like to have this power and ability too. Can you make it possible so that I can continue in the same kind of work I was doing before, tricking people and uh, using them for my own gain, exploiting them so that I can benefit? What does Peter say? Verse 21, You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this your wickedness and pray God if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Now folks, in the church today, let me tell you what a lot of people would say. Well, we don't need to do that to Simon. He's a brand new brother. He's just a baby in Christ. And you know, we need to be real careful, walk around on eggshells and just let him think that everything he's doing is completely acceptable and right and approved in the sight of God. And we certainly don't want to tell him he's doing anything wrong. We, we might turn him away. We might cause him to go somewhere else. We might, we might just ruffle his feathers and make him feel uncomfortable. And we shouldn't do that. Now, folks, is that what Peter's doing here? Is he saying, I'm not going to be sudden with this brother? No. Peter has a relationship with Simon. Simon's just been baptized. Simon needs to make a drastic change in the lifestyle and way in which he was living and needs to be made aware that it's not okay to continue doing what it was he was doing. Now, Peter does not leave him hopeless. Peter does not say, hey, you're never going to be able to be right with God ever again because of what you just said. That's not what he said. As a matter of fact, what Peter is providing here is uh, an explanation so that Simon won't be surprised. Oh, I'm not right with the sight of God. I need to make a change so that I can be forgiven, so that I can be right with Him once again. And so Simon goes on and responds and says in verse 24, Pray to the Lord for me that none of these things that you have spoken may come upon me. Hey, I don't want to be wrong in the sight of God. I get it, Peter. I'm ready to make a change. I'm ready to repent and change my mind and behave differently. I'm not going to be surprised when it comes to my eternal salvation. Thank you. 
discipline is not surprising. But folks, that doesn't mean there are not times where it's not going to be sudden. Sometimes there needs to be. Is discipline snobbish? Now why would we ask this question? What is the mindset that we might have regarding discipline and those who engage in it? Well, this person, they think they know everything. They think they're better than everybody. They act like they've never sinned before in their entire life. Who are they to tell me that I need to change my life? Who is this elder over here telling me that I need to change my life? Who is the preacher over there preaching Scripture? How dare he say this? He thinks he's so perfect. And so because of that mindset and the fact that we're aware of it, what do we say? Well, you know what? I don't want to be snobbish. I don't want to correct anyone. I don't want to tell anyone that they're in the wrong and that they need to make a change. And to discipline someone and to call them out on their behavior, well, that's snobbish. Well, folks, is discipline as God has commanded it snobbish? Look with me back in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Notice here in verse 15. As discipline is carried out, verse 14, how is this brother who was just disciplined, who was just withdrawn from, how is he to then be treated? You don't count him as an enemy. You admonish him or you warn him as a brother. Brother, it's time to repent. It's time for you to make a change. Now folks, here's the question that we need to ask. If we don't do this to an erring brother or sister, who is? Who is? Who's going to do it? Is their workplace going to do it? Is American Idol going to do it? Who is in the position? Who has the responsibility? Who are those who this erring brother or sister has the relationship with that can be leveraged to provoke them to actually make a change? Folks, it's God's people. It's God's people. And sometimes I think we're more concerned about saving face. We're more concerned about, well, you know what? If I see this brother or sister, I'm going to have to tell them they need to repent. And that makes me uncomfortable. <coughs> Folks, do we really believe regarding the Scriptures when it comes to our eternal destination? as to whether or not we are out of step with God's Word? If we really believe that, then should the eternal salvation of their soul take precedent and be urgent and be important to us to say, I need to say something here. I need to tell my brother in Christ, I need to tell my sister in Christ that I love them as a brother. I love her as a sister. You're not my enemy. I want you to be right with God. But God requires that you repent. That you make a change. Folks, discipline is not snobbish. Discipline is an act of love out of concern for the eternal soul. In that 1 Corinthians letter in chapter 5, Paul explains this in verses 4 and 5. He says, in the, same, uh, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together, along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Folks, it takes humility to discipline, not arrogance. It takes meekness and cleaving to God and His law to discipline. It's not being pompous. And these brethren, as they would carry out this discipline, maybe even initially, got it wrong as this brother made a change. In the second letter in chapter 2, Paul will explain to them, verses 1 through 11, you need to forgive this brother. This brother has changed their ways. You do not need to continue on having him be swallowed up with too much sorrow at the end there, verse 7. Therefore, 
Paul urges them to reaffirm their love to him. And brother, sister, that experience is one that doesn't exist anywhere else. <laughs> the experience of making up and reuniting once again with God's people. You know, sometimes people say, well, do I really need to go forward? You know, I've been unfaithful to the Lord. I've been out of step with God's law. Do I really need to go forward? Well, here's my question to that kind of thought. Do you want to be reunited with your brethren? Do you want to be in a state of liberty, trusting that you're all on your way to heaven once again with your brethren? Folks, if we've been out of step with God's law, guess what brethren are constantly wondering as you associate yourself with the brotherhood? Where's this brother standing? They committed this sin, or they were engaged in this, or they forgot the Lord for this amount of time previously, and they're like, where do they stand now? Do they realize that that was wrong? Do they realize that that's unacceptable? Have they really made a change? Are they really devoted to the Lord once again? Can I really trust them? Can I really embrace them? As my brother all the way to heaven above? And folks, once that change is made, once that brother or sister says, hey, I've done wrong, I've been disciplined, I get it, I want to be right with the Lord again, I repent, I'm whole. It is on every one of us to completely embrace that brother or sister with open arms, as if it had never happened. I'm not going to bring it up anymore. I'm not going to remember it anymore. I don't want my brother or sister to be in sorrow anymore. No, folks, discipline is not snobbish. Discipline is actually sensible. It is sensible. Why is it sensible? Well, back to that 2 Thessalonian letter in chapter 3. Paul explains there in verse 11, For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. Notice that in verse 13. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. Let me ask you a question. What do you think the rest of those football teammates are thinking when Odell Beckham Jr., when LaVon Bell... When all the big shots in NFL football aren't showing up to contribute in practice with them, what do you think is going through their mind? Why should I be here? <laughs> Why is it that I can't be special like this person? <clears throat> Why am I showing up? Do we have a team or not? What are we doing here? What can happen when someone is out of step and out of line with the group. The group then begins to question and become discouraged and say, hey, maybe they're right. Maybe we need to stop trying to hold on to what we're trying to hold on to. Maybe we just need to become as they are and that way this will be a lot easier. It'll be a lot easier. That's why Paul says in the first Corinthians letter, chapter 5, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. And that's why he's telling these brethren here, do not be weary in doing good. Keep at it. Stay the course. Discipline is sensible because it enables us to keep focused on our eternal mission and in our unity to see it through. Folks, open rebuke is better than secret love. Proverbs chapter 27 and verse 5. If we really love our brother, if we really care about our sister, our brother, and they're out of step, then God has given us an instruction manual, tools in our belt as to how we can win such souls back to His people to live faithfully once again. Are you here this morning and you're not faithful? You've fallen away. You've lived disorderly. You've been out of step. You know it. Everyone else knows it. God knows it. You haven't made it right yet. You haven't fixed it yet. You haven't repented yet. 
Well, won't you cross that path of <coughs> trying to be stubborn in your own will, become sorrowful over your sinful living, and repent so that we can embrace you, so that God can embrace you, so that you can be right with Him once again and have the hope of eternal salvation. Maybe you're here this morning and you're not yet a child of God. You've not yet become a Christian. You've not yet obeyed the Gospel and been baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins based upon your belief and confession in Him. If that's the case, you have the opportunity to do so just as Jesus commanded in Mark chapter 16 and verse 16. Do you have a spiritual need this morning? If so, would you please come forward as all